Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another of my introductory astronomy lectures. Well, last time I discussed the nature of light as being governed by wave principles and has wavelength and frequencies and speeds and amplitudes, but didn't really get around to how people know this. So let's actually begin, oh, let's go way back in time, and we'll go back to 300 BC, where the, the great philosopher Euclid, the Greek philosopher Euclid, actually in all of his work also discussed the nature of reflection. So he saw that actually all th the light was reflected off of surfaces. And so when we look at the nature of reflection, Euclid posited that as light hits a surface, the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. So this is kind of like when you actually throw a ball against a wall at an angle, it actually reflects off the same wall. And so Euclid started to thinking, I well, maybe light acts like a particle. And because it goes in these reflection, uh, because it bounces off of surfaces like a, like a particle does. Well, that was 300 BC. And then we come along 400 years later, and Ptolemy, remember him? Claudius Ptolemaeus uh, made the Almagest, did all the geocentric stuff. He also did important things with respect to light. And in about 140 AD, he discovered a relationship between, for refraction. So he learned, he discovered that the angle of incidence is proportional to the angle of reflection, of angle that, well, the angle of incidence into one meet from one medium, say air, through a surface like water, then if you, uh, the, 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 the light is refracted. So the angle of incidence is proportional to the angle of refraction after it passes through the new medium. And that's why when you take a stick and put it into, th into water, the stick looks like it's bent. That's because the light, weight, the light that's coming out of the water, that goes off, that's reflected off of the stick that's in the water, comes out of the water, the direction of the light is changed because the angle of, in the angle of incidence is different than the angle of refraction as it goes from one medium to another. However, Ptolemy couldn't compute anything other than they were proportional to each other. Then almost 800 years later, about 800 years later, the, uh, the, Iraqi, the Iraqi philosopher named Ibn Sal in, in about 980 AD, maybe 984 AD, actually determined that the angle of incidence, the sign of the angle of incidence, divided by the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to the speed of in of the speed of the wave the speed of light in one medium to the other medium and then to the in, to the reciprocal of the index of refraction of the one the the uh, the, in, the, out, the refracted medium to the inbound medium so that's what he learned and he learned that's what was the proportionality. It had to be proportional to the speeds of the light coming in. Well, he couldn't, because it's 984 AD, Ibn Saul from Iraq didn't have any way of measuring the speeds of light. He knew the ratio and the proportionality of the speed of light is different from one medium to another. The speed of light in air is different than the speed of light in water. And that's why there is refraction. So. The, it's refraction, refraction is a manifestation of the differing speeds of light in the two media. All right, well, that's 984 AD, and people are starting to figure out things about light. And uh, in 1020 AD, about uh, 40 years later, another Iraqi uh, researcher, well, called natural philosopher, by the name of, the name of Ibn al-Haytham, Ibn al-Haytham, was discovered and correctly posited that light is not emitted by the eye, it is rather received into the eye. Now that's a very interesting way of thinking because it, it changes the nature of philosophy. Because when people think about seeing things, they think about, oh, I'm looking at this thing. So therefore, when I look at it, it becomes visible. That's a fascinating way of thinking. So where does light come from? Well, we can think of light emanating, philosophically, we can think of light emanating from you and going out to that thing, illuminating it such that we can see it. That's a philosophical concept, but it's not borne out by reality. Um, so illumination or being able to see something uh, is not reflective of reality. But you know, you can see why people would say that because a blind person can't see. Why? Because their eyes don't emit anything. Uh, we still have such ideas inside of our current 
um, how should we say, mythology. Superman has eyes that beam out laser beams or, or heat vision. Um, you have, uh, from the Marvel side, of course, you have Cyclops, who, when he takes off the guard, he's always got spraying his vision, his laser vision out of his eyes. So the concept that the eye, what you see, you impact, is a very ancient idea and is part of mythology and culture. But it's not how it works. And this is how Ibn al-Thayyam determined how it worked. He looked at the nature of a camera obscura. So he's in the, uh, he's in the Iraqi desert. And it can get very, the, the sunlight can be extraordinarily intense. And the sand around can be extremely intense. So what he did is he found he used a camera obscura. So what he would do is he'd go inside a darkened tent. A very, very dark tent with no sunlight coming in. Dark as possible. And then he would let it make a little tiny hole on one side of the tent such that light could come in only in that beam. And then what he noticed is that if the rest of the tent was extremely dark, the hole acted as a camera obscura, which meant that the light was reflected off of, say, um, like, like maybe a, like a palm tree or something like that, or another building or another tent, dare I say a camel. But the, the, the light would reflect off that thing, go through the hole in the camera, and then be inverted as it passes through and makes an image on the far side of the tent. So when he thought about this, he said, well, wait a second. The eye is like a, whole, like a little tent. And the, the, uh, the iris of the eye, which is where the, where the pupil of the eye, is where the uh, light comes into. It gets inverted, and the eye then acts like the tent, and the pupil of your eye acts like the lens. So the camera obscura is the tent with one little hole in it, is exactly analogous to what the eye does. So the image that's formed on the far side of the tent is exactly how the eye works. The light is reflected off the object, comes through the pupil of the eye, di the diameter is modulated by the pupil, and then it goes to, it makes an image on the back of the retina, and that's how your eye works. And so it's a camera obscura, actually with a lens, so that it actually is more focused. So the nature, so he discovered this in about 1020 AD, and that gave, and finally got to the point where it's like, wait a second, it's not that the eye emits light. It's that the light comes through and then makes a picture that then we see. So reflection off of objects and then reception by the eye is how, is how it works. So that's an amazing discovery considering the weight of philosophical ideas against it and, way, and the way people think about it. In fact, you ask people how you see things, they might even think that they reach out with their eyes. And in fact, a lot of mystics think this too. It'd be easy, it's easy to find people who, who would think this, and in fact would justify it on mystical grounds. So in any event, that was actually shown in, a, in, in the deserts of Iraq during the European Dark Ages. Uh, science was flourishing across Islam, and specifically in Baghdad and Iraq, and, to, and then Baghdad and now current day Iraq. So then it comes along again, the Dark Ages are starting to fall in Europe, and in 1307, well, they're not so dumb, the Dark Ages, the dark, dark Ages just means it's not the Renaissance, but medieval thinkers are still on target with things. In 1307, a German, uh, German uh, natural philosopher, Theodoric of Freiburg, uh, comes up with an idea. What he does is he wants to understand rainbows. So what he does is he takes glasses filled with water and lets beams of light from the sun reflect around inside droplets of water. And he demonstrates that he can create rainbows by having the beam of light go at various angles of incidence inside of drops of water. So he determines then that rainbows in the sky are made by, by, uh, by refracted light through water in the sky. And he in fact determines the angle that it takes in order to in order to refract the light around inside a raindrop. And he notices that the angles of refraction and bouncing around inside the raindrop correspond exactly to what the, dis the angular separation of the sun is from the rainbow in the sky. So he determined that, well, these by measuring the nature of, of the rainbow in the sky and its angle away from the sun and how what it takes in order to reflect light around inside of drops of water, the angles that it takes, that tells you exactly how the uh, exactly how rainbows are formed. It's refracted light through water. Well, 
then that, that, that so that partly discover it partly goes towards the wave nature of light along with the refraction is a wave is a wave phenomena and then even the camera obscura is kind of a particle like phenomena because it shows rays and then we have reflection which is kind of like a particle like phenomena so because those are like bouncing things off of things um, but then there was a real clincher in 1660 Italian Franco Grimaldi uh, actually determined that light spreads out so meaning most people thought because of these particle concepts of the camera obscura and reflect, refraction, reflection, that light behaves very much like a particle. But if people are saying that, they say, well, wait a second, if it behaves like a particle, there's no way that the particles will spread out like, like water waves. So if you have a, a barrier with a small hole in it and water comes up against that barrier, when the waves hit from the water outside the barrier, like a dike in a, in a, in a river outside maybe a harbor, the waves will spread out from that point, and as though that's the point of origin. So they'll spread out in a semicircular pattern. That's water waves. What Grimaldi did is he showed that that also happened with, with light waves. So he determined that light doesn't just act like a particle, but it acts wave properties. And so by making a slit through which water passed in 1660, which eventually was published in 1665, the wave nature of light you know, due to diffraction which it diffracts around a boundary. So as light comes through a, a hole, it diffracts around that boundary and spreads out. That product of diffraction only happens as a wave. And so this started to solidify the concept of a wave nature of light. And then along comes Isaac Newton, who then really starts to try to understand the way rainbows are formed and how that all works. So let's look at what Newton's contribution is next time. See you soon.